and welcome back to the science of singing. Yeah, it's what we're up to. All right, so today I want to talk about a really important topic that actually I think gets asked probably the very most <laughs> um, with beginning singers and also um, I've had this conversation a lot with speech pathologists who are looking to get into singing because maybe they want to do some voice therapy, they want to learn how to do some voice therapy, and a lot of times singing training is a pretty important part of being able to help especially professional voice users, people who sing all the time, yeah? So having some understanding of what that is is usually a place people want to start. So we're going to talk about how to find a good voice teacher. And I've actually made notes for myself. I have them on my screen over here. So if you see my eyes glance over, I'm going to try to keep myself on time. What's up? Different today. All right. So, oh, and I do have a new glasses. Check it. Yeah, right? Um, so <laughs> I'll probably bring the blue ones back too. I still wear them some, but, you know, it's nice to have two pairs makes you a little less nervous about losing a pair. Anyway, it's nice. Okay. Also nice to have vision insurance. United States of America, it's pretty special. Be able to take get a new pair of glasses like every year. That's, that's super nice. Okay. Anyway, so let's get into it. How do we find a voice teacher? How do you find a voice teacher? Um, how do you know you have a good fit with the voice teacher you found? Um, you know, maybe you had a really great voice teacher in the past and now you've moved and you're looking for a new voice teacher. So essentially, I'm going to try to break it down into um, what makes a teacher a good fit, like good things you need to look out for for the teachers you're looking for, and then also some red flags, especially for beginners who've never really taken voice lessons. Um, knowing the red flags out there, I think are really important. And a lot of voice teachers, especially like at the university position and stuff, uh, don't always want to talk about the red flags, or maybe they get a little too uh, technique heavy when talking about issues with voice teachers. So I'm going to try and I think when you're a beginner, like getting really super technique heavy is, is a little daunting, because then you're like, well, how do I know? Right? So, um, so I'm just going to talk about general red flags that could be really negative toward your personal learning as a student. And those, are, I think, are the biggest red flags for you to look out for as a beginner. Um, there's a lot of personality fit that needs to happen that I think often gets ignored <laughs> by a lot of voice teachers. They don't really like to admit that there's a personality mismatch sometimes. Some do. Actually, a fair number do, but there are definitely those who don't quite see that it's important to have a fit. All right. So, um, let's talk about what makes someone a really good fit for you. And the first thing I really want to bring up is, especially if you're a beginner and you're first starting out thinking about taking voice lessons, say you've been trying to play around a little with yourself, you've been maybe following some blogs online, you've been trying a few exercises on your own, and you record yourself and you listen back and you're just not really making progress, you have no idea what you're doing, so then you probably went online or something and was like, what can I do for my singing? And people say, get a voice teacher. And you're like, okay, now what? Right? So the first thing you need to ask yourself is what style is it you really want to learn? Okay, so do you want to be a popular singer? Do you want to learn musical theater? Do you want to learn classical singing? Do you want to learn operatic singing? Um, you know, are you someone who sings at church and it's mostly like a belt style and maybe you want to really start there because you actually want to work on singing solos, perhaps? Um, or do you sing with a community choir in a classical way and maybe you want to work on solo classical singing? Uh, these are good things to start to think about. Like, where do you really want to start? Or are you a total 100% beginner who's open to learning any style? It's also good to know. Um, it's, I would say, fairly easy to find voice teachers who are trained classically to some extent, possibly depending on where you live, though. If you're in a more rural area, it might be a little harder um, in the United States to find that. But um, operatic singing is fantastic. Classical singing is great. It's not 100% necessary to learn to sing classically, to sing well in a pop style. Evidence being pretty much every belter out there who's had a really long career, you know? 
um, and including singers back in like the 1930s and stuff. Like Ethel Merman didn't have voice lessons. She didn't really learn to sing classically, you know, and she still had this huge career. She was Ethel Merman, right? And if you don't know who that is, go to Wikipedia and look up Ethel Merman, okay? Or just YouTube and look up Everything's Coming Up Roses with Ethel Merman. Um, <laughs> and, you know, um, I don't think Judy Garland had classical, like, classical technique type training. I think she might have had some training. I'm not sure, honestly. She started singing so young in movies. Holy cow. Right? So, and, you know, and then there's also singers like, honestly, Whitney Houston was an amazing singer. I know her voice got a little rough near the end there, but I strongly suspect as a voice teacher, the roughness was less due to her technique and more due to personal habits and things that were going on. <laughs> and unfortunately, we know what those were. Um, but, you know, that that would do a number on your voice uh, for sure. So, you know, so that's an important thing to know. Um, if you go, if you don't want to really, really learn classical, if you want to learn how to belt a little more or to be able to get some solos, you know, with the local band or something, or maybe you want to work on more contemporary musical theater type stuff, um, and you go to a teacher who's going to try to convince you you can only learn to sing classically because that's the technique that founds everything, um, maybe try out a few other teachers. You know, maybe see if there's somebody else who who has focused a little more on training contemporary singing. So there's like, what is it, um, CCT, like contemporary training stuff. So, you know, anyway, I can't remember what the acronym completely stands for. I really have an issue memorizing acronyms. Sorry about that, guys. Anyways, so you might want someone who has a little more training in contemporary singing and who understands that you don't really need to know. There are some foundations like breath and stuff like that that can carry over into that technique, but the resonance aspect is so different that you don't really have to start learning classical resonance in order to understand healthy resonance in contemporary singing. There are similarities that are overlap, but the laryngeal positioning is pretty different. So you don't really need one to learn the other. Oh, I know a lot of, there's there's probably like classical people who are going to get on the comments and be like, blasphemy! But I'm sorry guys, it's true, okay? There's some great singers out there who've never learned to sing operatically, and they're awesome and bomb and amazing. So, eh. So anyways, here we go. Um, the other thing to consider, there is this uh, piece of advice that you might hear from a lot of people called, uh, you know, you just need someone with a good ear. You're just paying for the ear, for the ear, for the ear, for the ear. I remember hearing that as a young student and being like, what does that even mean? Holy cow. Um, a lot of times I think what a good ear means is that person has an understanding of what professional level singing currently is in that area. So if it's operatic, this person actually has access to hearing professional level operatic singers, and I mean high level professionals. They've listened to those singers, they have experience hearing them close up, maybe they sing in a chorus at a big opera house. Um, maybe they just teach in a met, you know, in a, in a city area where they have some students who are professional level or they get to hear a lot of people like in the university or something, whatever. But they're hearing really high level singers pretty regularly so that they have it in their ear what a professional high level singer is in that area, including musical theater. They understand what somebody would be looking, what a casting director would be looking for when they're listening for someone for a new Rodgers and Hammerstein like production versus a more contemporary production. Okay, so somebody who has a pulse, an ear on the professional market, um, and they understand what casting directors are looking for. That's I think what really the good ear means. Um, and that usually coincides with understanding what technique is needed to get you to that point, to get you to that professional level where casting directors will hear you and go, oh yeah, I want that person, right? Um, so that's I think what most people mean by you need to find someone with a good ear. It's not just they understand if you're in pitch or not. It's not just, you know, um, 
you know, there's a lot of nuance to it, essentially, that I think goes into it. Um, also, of course, it means they have a good ear for, they, they understand what is an easy vocal production, like what's a sustainable vocal production versus what's strained and pushed and effortful. Um, because if you're training to be a professional singer, honestly, really at any level, even in the pop world, there's definitely singers in the pop world who get by with not singing super well and they can sing along to recordings and performances and stuff. But if you want to be someone who doesn't do that, if you want to be someone who can sing a two hour concert um, and make it through, um, then, you know, you need to have a certain ease to your production so that you have the stamina and um, someone with an ear to what that sounds like is important. Um, okay, so there's also the thing to consider. The other thing to consider is how do you learn? as a person. And this is kind of part of that personality fit. You need to understand that about yourself. So think of any time you've ever had to learn some new motor, motor coordination. Maybe you were learning a new sport, you were learning how to swim or how to ski, or maybe you were learning how to dance a certain dance or something. And you think about like if you were in a formal setting, what worked when you were learning and what didn't work. So there are teachers out there who have phenomenal ears Okay, like they can tell you, yes, that's hireable sound and nope, that's not hireable at all. But that's the only feedback you'll get from them. They're kind of the yes, no teachers. They're just binary. It's either right or wrong or that's good singing and that's bad singing. And if you're a really analytical person, if you're someone who needs to break down the concepts and really build it up and like really build a certain foundation, like knowledge foundation, that probably won't be a style of training that works really well for you. I have known singers who can work great under that condition. Singers who, for some reason, if somebody just says, nope, not good, try it again, they can actually make some changes and really make great gains that way. I personally can't do it. It's not a good setting for me. Um, I really need to be able to really think about the concepts they're telling me, why was it a little off? Was that a little closer to what you were looking for? I need kind of more of a continuum, less of a good, bad. It's, it's really, it impacts me in a negative way if I think of things as good or bad, because I will land into always thinking of things as bad, and then I'll just be trying things over and over again to try to find something different that hopefully is good, and I won't have a sense of where I'm actually trying to go. So I need someone who understands it's a little more of like a continuum and more of a process and a journey and someone who could say things like, okay, that sounded like it was a little easier, but we lost touch with this aspect of resonance. So let's try it again, keeping the ease and going for whatever, darker sound, brighter, whatever. They can come up with some sort of cue there, right? But I need someone who could give me something more like that rather than just, no, nope, not good, sing it, and then they sing it at you, and then they say, try it again. There's great singers out there like that, and there are teachers out there with fantastic ears who teach like that, and there are singers who learn how to sing like that through those teachers, but there's also a lot of us, I think, there's probably the bulk of people who train can't really learn that way very effectively. Um, we tend to need more of that breaking it down and, and really thinking about it and asking questions and having the teacher explain the concepts and demonstrate but also explain and all of that kind of thing um, to try to get us somewhere, right? Um, also, to bring that up, the other thing about the good ear um, that I want to go back to briefly is you might need different teachers at different point in your training. So um, if you're first starting out and you feel like you have no idea what you're doing and you feel like your voice is different every day and like maybe you record yourself one day and you sound pretty good and then the next day you really cannot get that sound back again, you have no idea. It's just kind of this constant moving target of what the heck your voice is going to do with you. Um, you might need different teachers at different points. So if you're that level where you're super beginner, can't really be super consistent with your singing, don't really know what your actual vocal range really is on a consistent basis. Consistent vocal range is what's really important, professionally speaking. Consistent. It does not matter if you hit that one note that one time back in, you know, April of 1999, I hit this one note. Nobody cares. Professionally, it's what can you get paid to do every day, all the time, right? It's consistency. 
So, um, so if you need to get that consistency, you need someone who can build that technique, which might mean you need someone who can help you to analyze it, build up the concepts, help teach you all of that sort of stuff so you can become your own teacher. Um, after you've established it, after you have a pretty consistent technique, and you know maybe you're pretty close to professional level, you've probably had some low-level professional gigs here and there, you know, you have a lot of experience, you've had a lot of training, you feel like you have some grip on things, but you just need someone to get you to the next level. Like you know that you're still a little more student sounding and you want to really sound high level, polished professional. Then you might need someone who, that's when you might need to go to the person who's literally like one foot in the door in the casting world. They know exactly what people are looking for and they're polishers. So they might not be able to teach you how to breathe, but they can tell you, ah, no, try it again, you need more of this sound. And if you have the flexibility and the consistency to be able to make those changes with the no, try it again people, then you need someone who has that really good ear. And I mean like that person is like in the room with casting directors knowing exactly what's going on professionally. And you're gonna probably pay out the nose for that person, but, <laughs> but that's who you need. And a lot of times in the opera world, um, lately, at least this is just the reality, I think people tend to get their technique built in schools, for example, and then they kind of find someone else as they go along. They need, they need someone who gives them that polishing. Sometimes they need someone who retrains them. That's a different issue for a different video. But yeah, so consider that fact. You might need someone with a good ear. In the beginning, a good ear can mean they know when you're strained versus when you're not strained, and they can help you find consistency. And a good ear as you're more advanced can mean you need the person who knows exactly what that casting director is looking for and they can get that sound from you and they can help you find what that really polished professional sound is. Um, for myself as a voice teacher, I, um, I have a sense of what professional sound is, but honestly, I'm probably better as a voice builder, a technique builder. So I have a good ear for what's easy, what's vocal ease, what's strain, et cetera, et cetera, and helping students find that consistency. Um, when I would have students who were more advanced, like my most advanced students, when they're auditioning and going off to new schools or to jobs or whatever, or they're moving, or maybe I was moving, but <laughs> especially if they were moving somewhere, then I would usually encourage them to find a teacher who really knows the professional world they're wanting to go into and can really help them because if I knew their technique was stable enough that I could send them off to anybody and they can still sing pretty well, then I'm like, go to somebody who really knows how to make you sound like totally polished for those auditions, essentially. Um, okay, so with the last few minutes here, I want to do talk a little bit about red flags, things to look out for for voice teachers out there that honestly, I kind of wish we, I wish nobody had to look for these red flags, but they do exist. And these are teachers that I really don't think um, belong in the field, but there you go. Um, but they're definitely out there. So one of the biggest red flags, cult studios. So the idea of, you know, this person is the only person within the Western United States that could teach anybody how to sing. That is a very dramatic statement. And if you hear it from several students in that studio, uh, okay, if it's like that teacher's really convincing those students that they really are the only one possibly who could ever teach them how to sing and they're like worshiping the ground they walk on, but at the same time, maybe you've heard several of their students and you're thinking, well, that's not exactly like the best sound. I don't really like necessarily all of their sound. Um, and they look really effortful. Maybe you can actually see like a lot of strain in their singers. Then it's like, you know, okay, let's just not go to that person. Um, I've lived in places where there are teachers like that, that I'm like, I know 100% I'm not going to walk in that person's studio ever. I'm not even going to try a single lesson with them because I don't trust that that teacher really knows how to teach. I trust that they know how to convince people that they know how to teach. But that's different than actually knowing how to teach, right? So if, if really all that person is doing is convincing people that they know how to teach and they're the only one who knows, 
put the brakes on that. Okay. Um, also to watch out for teachers who don't want to teach their students to be their own teachers. I think the end goal really, if you're going to train anyone to have any kind of longevity in singing, whether professional or not, um, the person has to learn to be their own teacher. You have to learn the flexibility and the technique to be able to make changes on the fly in the middle of performance. You're not feeling 100% that day, how do you get through your performance? How do you pace yourself vocally? Um, how do you know you can totally hit that note even if you're like, eh, I'm getting a little dry, it's kind of the end of the act, I really need some water, maybe I'm a little tired because I got a little too into that one scene, what can I do to get myself through this, okay? You need that, and that's you being your own teacher. That's you knowing, um, okay, I need to, you know, uh, I need to take a bigger breath, I need to lower my breath, I need to make sure my shoulders are intense, I need to, you know, like you being able to troubleshoot your own technique. So you've got to be able to troubleshoot for vocal longevity and for learning how to be a performer. And teachers who don't want to teach that are usually people that I think are very insecure. They're worried that they won't have a studio. They're really worried about losing the income. If they teach their students how to teach, then if those students don't need you, what do you do for your income? And I feel like that's a bad sign because I found for myself, if I was in it just to be the best teacher I could, the students come. You don't have to worry too much. They do come. The students start coming to you and they might even start coming to you in droves and you might have a long wait list, you know? And, um, and that's really the, the difference, I think. The teachers who have confidence in their teaching and confidence that that teaching will be valued and people will come to them versus teachers who are like, oh my God, if a student leaves me, I am out that income and I'm screwed. So I need to really try to convince that person to stay with me. Nah, you know what? If you're not a good fit, go find someone else. That was my way of seeing it. And that's the way most teachers, I think good teachers, confident teachers would really see it as like, yeah, if I'm not a good fit for you, awesome. Go find someone who works. All the best to you, you know? All right. Um, also, the other big red flag I think that is just in general, the can be a red flag for toxic personalities in general, is the idea of like, you know, if the teacher really is unable to tell you what you do well, they're unable to tell you what you need to be professional. Like, here's where you're at. Here's what you do really well. Here's how you sound. This is awesome. Here's what I want to give you to get to where I think you would be even more professional or even more consistent if we tackle this one aspect right now. Here's the biggest bang for your buck. You know, like you have a student, I've had this several times where students come in and they sound amazing. Like they're like, Sutton Foster level, like, you know, Sutton Foster got her Thoroughly Modern Millie job, like, before she had any actual training for voice, and she's been on several interviews, I've seen her talk about how, like, once she was in that gig, doing eight shows a week, she's like, oh, I need to, like, learn how to sing, because, really, she needed to learn how to be her own teacher, she needed to learn how to troubleshoot on stage, which she didn't know, but obviously she sounded professional, because she got the gig, right, she got cast in a lead role, you know, <laughs> without um, having training. So I've had those students who walk in and they sound amazing, like amazing. And I think, oh my gosh, where am I going to start with this person? They are so, and they kind of knock your socks off as a teacher because you don't expect it. It's not common. These people are very rare. They were not who I was. I was not that person. So, <laughs> um, <clears throat> so they're rare students and they come in really good. And so, you know, at that point, my job is really, I'm thinking consistency. How can I get, I want to teach this person how to troubleshoot when they have any sort of vocal issues. I want to maybe challenge them a bit, get them to sing pieces that they never thought they'd be able to sing. I would probably start from those kind of places. Maybe polish up a little bit, maybe their breath or something, but really just getting them that consistency so they really know what they're doing on the stage and they really feel like they can troubleshoot their own voice. Um, and I ask, and that's what I would tell them. It's like, you know what? You're sounding really good. I want to challenge your breath. I want to challenge your range. And I want to make sure that whatever is the performer, professional range you have, the kind of pieces you can sing are really consistent, really good, really easy for you. And that you could sing for two, three hours on stage, or you could do a performance, sorry, for two or three hours on stage 
and know how to get yourself out of trouble if you're in trouble vocally and know how to get through that performance and how to pace yourself. Um, so if somebody, if you're that singer who you have a sense you sound really good and you've never even trained and you do recordings and you're like, dang, I sound really good. This is pretty sweet. And you still want some, you still, you, maybe you've gotten to that point where you've actually gotten some professional gigs without training and now you're like, maybe I need some training. If you're going to someone who wants to basically build you from the ground up, meaning like they got to break you down, they got to make you think you don't know anything about breath, you don't know anything about vocal technique, um, and then they want to build you up from there, but they don't tell you that you're already very professional sounding, or they can't tell you that it's not that you don't, you know, you're already, you have really great vocal habits that we need to build on. That is more important than I need to convince you you don't know how to sing so that you can take with me. I feel like that's a pretty big red flag and um, it's a sign that that person, I mean, it could be a toxic personality, but it also could just be someone who doesn't have confidence to know what to do with you because you're that good. And honestly, if you're that teacher, say you're earlier on in your career and as a teacher, maybe you're a new teacher and you get that student and you're like, I have no idea what to do with this person. If you genuinely have no idea, then talk to the student about that. Say like, Here's the thing, you're sounding amazing. I'm not sure where we need to start. Um, do you have any problems that you really wanna work on? Do you have pieces that are too much of a challenge for you right now that you would like to bring and work on? Cause I'm, I'm willing to try to figure this out with you. The other thing is, you could keep that inside too, where you're like, just tell them to bring in challenging pieces and you work from there. Um, but the other aspect is like, maybe suggest a different teacher. Maybe like, I might not be the right teacher for you because you sound more advanced than most singers I've ever worked with. So maybe try a more advanced teacher. You know, there's no shame in that. And if they still want to come back to you, fantastic. Let's just work from what's a challenge for you because that's what you need me for. You need me for challenges. You don't need me for the stuff you can do easily. You know, and that's where you find the, the gaps in their technique. Okay, so to summarize this fairly lengthy video yet again. Um, finding a good teacher that's a good fit. What style do you want to learn? Do you want to learn contemporary? Do you want to learn classical? Do you want to learn both? And knowing, you know, will that teacher actually teach you the style you really want to do? <laughs> because they, they need to at least, even if they want to teach you classical, if you really want to sing contemporary, they need to be willing to teach that too and work on pieces like that, okay? If they just throw that out completely, Maybe not the right choice. Um, what someone with a good ear means. If you're in the stage where you need you need to learn how to troubleshoot your voice, you need to learn how to be consistent with your voice, um, you need someone with an ear for what is easy vocal technique, what is, you know, solid and understandable and, and great. Um, if you have, you know, a lot of ears under your belt, you have that consistency, then a good ear is someone who knows what professional sound is um, for your particular style and for your professional world. They know what casting directors are looking for and they can really help you polish yourself to have the best audition packet possible and to present yourself as professionally as possible. Um, if you learn best being analytical and having someone really dive into certain concepts for you, you need someone who can do that sort of explanation. They need to be able to explain like why they're having you do certain things and what it's working on. Um, if you're someone who doesn't need that, if you are fine with someone who says, no, nope, that's not good, and they sing at you and you do it again, then all right, fine. But if you're like in the majority, I would say, who need a little more explanation than that, then make sure that teacher can give you that explanation that you need. Um, and then big red flags is just the, the cult studio personalities you know, the person who's the only person in all of the East Coast who can teach you. It's like, come on, you know, you know how many voice teachers there are in New York City alone? There, it can't be that that person is the only person. Um, and then similar to that, a teacher who maybe due to insecurity of not knowing what to do with an advanced singer, or maybe just due to just their own personality type, they don't appreciate what you already bring to the table, and they don't want to help you with what you have a challenge with and to get you that consistency to be professional. Instead, they wanna just sort of break you down and make you feel like you don't know what you're doing at all so that you kind of end up being dependent on that person to tell you everything, to be like the key holder to singing. 
And that's, I think, just unnecessary for some, there's some singers out there, especially in contemporary style, who do not need training to sound amazing. What they need training for is to be consistent and to be able to troubleshoot when they're performing. So, um, kind of knowing a feeling of where you are. Hopefully this helps some folks out there. Um, and uh, I'm going to be posting some more. I'm losing my hair tie, even though I already have my hair back because that's how I roll apparently. I have like three hair ties at once. Sorry, I'm also bumping the table. But anyway, I will see you guys next time. Um, I'm gonna talk about the science of vocal imagery. Why that actually is still using science and like behavioral science. We always think of acoustics and physiology and yes, that stuff's important, but there is this whole other aspect of how people learn that can really help um, increase who you are as a voice teacher, I think. So, so this is gonna be a series, especially for voice teachers out there. But it's also good for singers if you're interested in really um, learning how to practice and how to maximize your own learning when you're kind of on your own. You know what I'm saying? All right. So I will see you guys next time. Hope you have a great day. Bye.